Welcome to Days of Roar, Detroit Tigers podcast brought to you by of the Detroit Free Press. My name is Mark Gorosh. I am here with Free Press beat writer Evan Petzold. We're here after a eventful opening day weekend. Eventful opening day week. Tigers won three, then lost two out of three. Evan Petzold crisscrossed the eastern United States a few times. Actually in his apartment for the first time in a long time doing a pod. How you making out there, buddy? Yeah, it sure feels that way. Bouncing all over the place ever since spring training ended. I was hoping to really enjoy an off day on Thursday. Turns out that off day turned into a doubleheader day. And it was an early flight back or a late flight back, excuse me, on Thursday with the Friday home opener at Comerica Park. So, yeah, it's been busy, man. It's been stressful. The, the you know, Chicago trip was one thing. And then I decided for some odd reason, because I love my wife and I love my cats, to drive back home to, you know, just get one night, you know, sleep in bed and, you know, get a chance to be in the shower and, you know, do all the things that I'm used to under my own roof. Wanted to get a little taste of that, but that was pretty difficult on the travel and then ended up in New York and had two games postponed by rain. And then there was a doubleheader on what was supposed to be an off day. And then right into the weekend with three games, Friday's game, obviously there was so much intensity with that just because of the fact that it was the home opener. There were a lot of fans. People showed out at Comerica Park. That was great to see. And the Tigers got a five to four win. And then they dropped the next two games to finish the series against the Oakland Athletics. And we know the Oakland Athletics, not a great baseball team. And so to drop both of those games and only score one run in 18 innings, that's not great to see after the way they started off. Let me correct myself. We had a three and three week, just so I uh, am factually accurate. And you know, we're going to get into this much deeper and we're going to get into it much deeper with our guest, Bobby Scales, too. But, you know, the Detroit Tigers had scored 20 runs in regulation in the first nine innings of baseball games in nine games. So the last two days are a microcosm of what the first nine games are. So we'll get into that. There are probably reasons for it. Not nearly as much worth panicking about as all of us are doing, but uh, yeah, these last two games were just brutal. And I think I tried to let everybody know before the series starts, something happens to the Detroit Tigers when they play the Oakland A's. Basically, they're terrible. They're terrible in Oakland. They're for sure terrible in Detroit. And whatever spell they have over the Tigers... Uh, I'm glad to see him leave because it's just really, really bad baseball to watch. Yeah, that's what happens when Oakland is involved and Detroit is in the mix too. It seems like Oakland has, you know, the Tigers number time and time again. Maybe the Sacramento A's won't have as much luck. Maybe the Las Vegas A's won't have as much luck either, you know, in future years. But yeah, it's definitely been trying times when the Tigers play against Oakland. And, you know, we saw that in the last two games. Again, man, just one run in the past 18 innings, it's not good enough. You know, the A's have some interesting players, but just not a lot of them. You know, Mason Miller, that's pretty interesting. I don't know how you guys feel. I mean, Lucas Ursag to me, is interesting, although we seem to hit him. But you know, they have other players that are kind of interesting. Obviously, Galoff is an extremely interesting player. But, you know, the bottom line is, if you don't hit, you can't win. I mean, you know, the idea is score some runs, and we're just anemic when it comes to that kind of stuff. All right, let's jump into the big two. Question number one of the big two. Back-to-back losses against the Oakland A's. Lost the series. Do we feel differently about this team today compared to we do, you know, compared to how we felt about them three days ago? You go first there, beat writer. Yeah, this is for the panic crowd. Look, you guys, nine of 162 games, that's 5.6% of the season. So there's so much baseball left to be played. Here's where I'm at on this, all right? I believe the Tigers could be in the mix for the American League Central three days ago. I still believe that. I believe the Tigers would finish in second place in the AL Central. That was how I felt three days ago. I still believe that. Here's what else I've talked about and written about several times. Nothing about this season is going to be linear from an offensive standpoint, and that's been the biggest concern. Here's what I wrote last week in Freep.com. I wrote, the plan is for the pitching staff to stabilize the team by keeping games close as young hitters develop. All well manager A.J. Hinch gets the most out of his 26-man roster. That was true then. It's still true now. And I think what we've seen 
is just examples of that in every single game this season where, you know, sure, maybe the young hitters are struggling a little bit or they have, you know, one game that looks really good. Torkelson had a big game in Friday's home opener. It looked really good. He, he looked terrible Saturday and Sunday. And so we're going to see some of that up and down from these guys, the veteran hitters, Mark Canna, Gio Rochella, Carson Kelly, they're doing their, their part to pick up the slack. And the pitching staff right now is determining whether or not the Tigers win or lose games. Now, ultimately, the pitching staff does not score the runs, but it's can the pitching staff limit an opposing team to zero, one, or two runs? If that's the case, you got to feel pretty good about where the Tigers are at because you can hope that their offense is going to be able to scratch across at least one, two, maybe even three runs. But nobody's complaining about the starting rotation of the bullpen, which I think is a good sign because the Tigers built the pitching staff to anchor this team. And so far, that's happening as planned. I think the Tigers have a top 10 pitching staff in baseball when you consider the starters, the relievers, and how much depth there is up and down. So they win six of their first seven games, and all of those seven games are close games. All six wins were one-run wins or extra inning wins. That's just incredible. It's not sustainable, but it makes sense when you consider that the pitching staff has been dominant with a starting pitcher ERA of 3.56, a reliever ERA of 1.11. Relievers, that's third in baseball. Starters, that's 11th in baseball. So the pitching staff has really shown out. Everyone's complaining about the offense, but this is what we expected. This is what Scott Harris told us was going to happen on February 14th in spring training when he said, young hitters are going to be all over the lineup. They're going to struggle at times. The pitching staff has been built to keep games close. That's happened. So no, I'm not worried. I think we're going to see a lot of ups and downs this season, though. That That's really what it's going to come down to for me. That That's where I'm at with this team after nine games. So I'm not worried either. But here's what I have to say about the hitting and about what Scott said to you. And I think for the most part, for a while, I've been pretty well behaved, but I'll say it in the most diplomatic way I can say it. I tweeted it, which is when your job is to build something and you're making excuses before you build it, why it's likely not going to work well. Well, maybe, just maybe, the plan had flaws. And that's coming from somebody that actually builds things. So you cannot have a plan to build something and be making excuses about it before you build it. It's a bad plan if that's what you did. So if that's what he's saying before the season starts, that's a bad plan to me. Doesn't mean it won't work, just means it's a bad plan. That's all I got to say about it. Well, that just means that there's flaws in the plan, right? And I think you you alluded to that. And, and I think he openly admitted that there were potential flaws in the plan, but you have to ride that roller coaster until you figure something out. I mean, I, I get it. I understand. And I think that leads into question two of the big two, but you know, no, it's 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 a fascinating conversation. It's a fascinating to- fascinating topic. Something that we're going to be following all season long as we evaluate the starting pitching is this good, the bullpen is this good. Why can't the offense be that good too? And if there's that disconnect, that's where there's going to be trouble when it comes to really winning games and, and really making a push for the postseason. And you know, sure, maybe that all blends into next year, and maybe because. They're giving young players runway. They're going to be able to plug and play when they need to in the future. And let's say that there's a hole at third base. Maybe they go get Bregman, right? Let's say that Torkelson, maybe he struggles and and he, you know, he has a really hard time of getting going and it's just not really working. And maybe he's not the, the, the future at first base, or maybe the Tigers are going to fill the designated hitter spot in a certain way. And maybe they want a hybrid with Torkelson in the first base bid and kind of platoon those guys. Maybe they go and get a Christian Walker next off season or something like that. I'm just saying, you can't you, you can't plan ahead until you see what you have right now. And so I understand the strategy of letting the young players play, letting them get at bats. But it does suck that the downside of that is there's going to be a lot of ups and downs, and it's going to be a frustrating season in that way. When you know what we've seen so far is this pitching staff is just going to be rock solid. I want to get to question two of the big two because I want to get to Bobby as quickly as we can, and it's it's a lot of what we're discussing anyway. Considering the topic of conversation sparked by question number one, let's revisit this topic for question two. Should the Tigers have added another big bat in the offseason? I also want to add in, you've been alluding to the fact that the starting pitching's been so good, and it's only been nine starts. But let's be really blunt about it. Everything we saw from Flaherty today is everything Baltimore saw from Flaherty last August and September. Kenta Maeda, 
was good for the last four innings he threw yesterday. Aside from that, he struggled. Thank goodness you got Matt Manning, five and two-thirds no-hit innings in the minor leagues. So the question is now, you spent $14 million on Flaherty, you spent $24 million on Meta. okay? Last year, you spent $10 million on Matthew Boyd. So now you've got three starting pitching expenditures. You really haven't got much for any of them. And you have hitting issues, and you got Mark Canna, who's been a joy to watch everything that you want Tiger hitters to aspire to be. But should they have been more aggressive? Were there other players to pursue? And was it a mistake not doing that? So I'll share that question, allowing you to answer first, and I have a few thoughts about it too. What's your problem with Jack Flaherty and Kent Maeda? Why are you dragging them in the first week of April? I mean, do we not do we not remember that Jack Flaherty, you know, Six innings, one run ball, zero walk, seven strikeouts in his first time out. Does that just disappear from from the ledger now or no? I get it. I get it. I get it. On Sunday, he was tough. He, he was leaving pitches over the middle. Wasn't good enough. I, I, he had, you know, a couple of two strike pitches that he really could have gotten himself out of innings and didn't do that. I understand. But at the same time, Jack Flaherty was lights out in spring training. Also looked really good in his first start. So if he had one bad start where maybe he didn't have the feel for his fastball, are we going to write that off as a bad signing? I'm going to be paying attention when it's been going on since 2020. So that's my answer. As far as Kenta Maeda, I like Kenta Maeda. At the same time, he's throwing 89 miles an hour and he's been very, very poor spinning sliders. I mean, the slider itself has just been... Absolutely a nightmare. Well, and the fastball command's been bad too, Mark. And if the fastball command's not good, then the secondary stuff isn't going to come with it. So I think once he starts to locate his fastball, whether it's 89 or 91, and I would love 91, but even if it's 89, just locate that puppy. And then everything else hopefully is going to come with it. You'll be able to see land more of the splits. And the slider for sure is, is, is a problem pitch for him right now. It, it needs a lot of improvement. But I think it all starts with commanding the fastball for him. But my point is, is like, I don't think that we should be writing either of those guys off yet. It's way too soon. That is this extreme overreaction, but it's fair to ask about the offense because that's what the Tigers didn't do. I, I, I In the show sheet, I wrote down another big bat. I should have just wrote any big bat because Mark Hanna is not really a big bat. Gio Urshela is not a big bat. And, and sure, Mark Hanna has the leadership qualities, the on-base percentage that you like. Gio Urshela, a really good guy, you know, bat-to-ball skills, contact guy. It's really good for this team. They need a guy that can put the ball in play, even there if they're just going to be, you know, dunks over the, the the shortstop's head or over the second baseman's head and into the gaps. And you know, those are okay, even if it's not home run power. The Tigers need a hitter like that. But how about a big bat? What about a Cody Bellinger? What about a JD Martinez? What about a Jorge Soler? How about a Teoscar Hernandez? Those were guys out there. Even a Jamer Candelario, who the Tigers are very familiar with, out there as well. Matt Chapman is somebody that you know, was talked about quite a bit externally from the fan base and the Tigers didn't move on any of those guys. We're nine games into the season. There are going to be ups and downs. I think that's okay, though. I think that's what what we want. Like the whole point of this is to let the young players develop who sinks, who swims, and then supplement. What happens if Jace Young, Justice Bigby, maybe Justin Henry Malloy? What if those guys hit and they need spots on the roster? There's a big drop off before you get to the Kevin McGonagall's and the Max Clark's of the world. So the Tigers, at some point, sure, they probably go, do need to go make an outside addition. Maybe that happens as soon as, you know, this upcoming offseason, right, after this season is over. But also, who knows, because what happens if everyone hits? Super unlikely. But what if Jace Young and Justice Bigby rake? What if they need spots in the big league roster and there's only 13, you know, position players available? So I, I like the idea of waiting and seeing. And I think, sure, the young hitters are struggling right now, but that's going to happen. Look, I think the conundrum becomes everybody wanted to go get J.D. Martinez. You know who wanted the Tigers to go get J.D. Martinez? Me. You know who else? You did. Okay. No, I wasn't on on the J.D. train. I can't. I I definitely was not. Okay. All right. But the bottom line is the difficulty with it is once you got Canna, unless you were going to not play Parker Meadows, and no matter how poorly he has come out of the gate. Nobody 
was against the idea of playing Parker Meadows. Nobody. If you were, you're either dumb or lying. Okay. Then who was their best, most consistent hitter in spring training? Parker Meadows. Parker Meadows has not hit the ball hard more than once or twice the entire first nine games. He's starting to look a lot like he did when he was struggling and he's kind of in between and he's kind of lost his aggressiveness. Do I like Parker Meadows? Yes. Am I willing to struggle with Parker Meadows for a while? A hundred percent. But When you start talking about adding big bats, then you start going, well, we should have got a third baseman. And my answer to that question is, look, the idea of signing Matt Chapman, you know, whoever wanted to do that, yeah, okay. I mean, people could want to do that. I wasn't necessarily in favor of it. And guys, unless you're blind, watching Gio Urshela play is a thing of beauty. It's like watching a baseball player play chess. He knows when to swing hard when to dunk the ball all over the field. He's the most annoying good hitter we have in the entire lineup. All he does is put the ball in in play hard or for a hit at the most opportune times in the highest leverage situations. So I have no issue with what they're doing at third base. At the same time, when you start sharing with me that maybe we want to feed in young players, Colt Keith not by far the best hitting prospect in the Tiger organization, yes or no? Completely. All right. So Colt Keith's at bats are spectacular. Has he smoked the baseball? Not really. But are the at bats solid? Absolutely. Do you feel like he's overmatched? Mm, well, he's not crushing, but he's been okay. Would you agree with he's been okay? Four walks, four strikeouts, and 32 plate appearances. He's going to be just fine. Just fine. And and the defense, he's a plus three, I think, DRS already. He's solid. I mean, no, no, he's solid. Look, I, he's solid, and he's trying to figure out his timing. He's done that at every single level where he's moved up. He's had to make some timing adjustments, and once he locks in, he gets going. I bet you he's going to be raking in May. Kerry Carpenter, right, not going to hit against lefties, but I like the production against righties. I like... I like his I like his plan of attack. I think he does a good job of sticking to it. He knows his strength is the power, the long ball, and he goes out there and he's not afraid to try to get to it. But at the same time, he doesn't sacrifice a ton of swing and miss. I think that's that that's the important piece. Is he's not like a a Joey Gallo type swing and miss guy. That's not Kerry Carpenter. Riley Green is great. Okay. Riley Green is awesome. He is on pace for 54 home runs right now. Okay. He's not going to get there. That's not sustainable. But we're going to see more of this hit-homer balance for Riley. Right now, it's more homer than hit. And he's getting him to the pull side, though. That's encouraging. We've talked about that a lot. He's got three homers, two of them to the pull side. That's good to see. Sure, he's hitting below 200 right now, but I don't think that matters. It's nine games into the season. So Cole Keith is looking good in terms of his plate appearances. Kerry Carpenter, I think the same is true for him. Riley Green, I love Riley Green. I think Riley Green's a really good player. Six walks, eight strikeouts, 38 plate appearances. That's a good sign, Okay. It's going to come around. Riley Green is days away from, you know, getting on a, a roll and just mashing. Okay? He's the best hitter. He's the best hitter the Tigers have, Mark. Parker Meadows, I understand the concerns with him because the batting average is low. But what I love is he's hitting out the leadoff spot and he's drawing walks like crazy, which is a good thing. Now, I understand that his results, both expected and actual on um, contact, have been terrible. Like, that's really concerning. He's not hitting the ball hard. He has the strikeout issues. The fastball up and away is a problem, as well as non-fastballs down and in. Those are issues for him. But he's drawing walk, walks like a madman, like he's getting on base, which is exactly what you want out of your leadoff hitter, even if he's not hitting, and he plays elite defense. Here's my question, though, Mark. All the concern about the offense, does it boil down to Spencer Torkelson, a career 220 hitter with a 300 on base percentage and over 1,000 plate appearances, the fact that he hasn't heated up yet, the fact that he has it turned on a ball and pulled it over that fence in left field. Is that why you think there is this external concern from the fan base that your primary two hole hitter feels like an automatic out right now? Is that the reason why the offense is looked on so negatively? And, and, and is that where you're at nine games in right now? Well, let's go over some basics. The Tigers have how many players on their roster capable of driving in over 80 runs? Answer that question for me. 
Well, Torkelson's done it, so I know he can do it. Riley Green, maybe Kerry Carpenter. Maybe. 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 Cole Keith, I think. Cole Keith, I think, can be that dude. Maybe not this year, but I think he well, can be I'm, that I'm, dude. I'm, I'm, let's, let's stay in the here and the now. So then the here and the now, they got two and a maybe. That's not a lot, okay? So if one of those two that you were counting on looks like he did from 2022, hasn't been on time for much of anything, okay, and has zero barrels after nine games, and you already have some short memory about an entire season in 2022 of a lot of the same things. It's not like it was five years ago. Does it concern you? Hell yes, it concerns you. Okay. Could he jump out of it in two games? Look, Riley was swinging like ass for, for, for numerous games in the last nine. The last four or five games, though? Pretty damn good. Rectified the circumstances, okay? And they're getting more and more consistent. But Spencer Torkelson, you can't go on for a really, really long time with him contributing this little because it's not like he contributes in other ways. He's not a good base runner. He's not a great defender. It's not like he walks a ton, okay? Spencer Torkelson is there to bang. And if he's not going to bang, it's a big problem. Tigers got three black holes in their lineup, okay? So far, shortstop, first base, and whenever Jakey's been catching. Now, thank God Jake behind the plate is a wizard. He is like a tour guide. He optimizes every pitcher who throws to him, unlike Carson Kelly. But he isn't hitting anything. He may have struck out in like 80% of his plate appearances. So the Tigers, they have some issues scoring. And when you, you know, when Baez and Torkelson are basically together, capable of doing zero, that, that's a real problem for them. And I, you're going to have to see how they're going to navigate it because those two guys are playing every day. And hitting Torkelson second and third and fourth, I wouldn't be shocked that this week, if he's not swinging better in the next two days, that changes. So Mark Hanna's moving up in the lineup. Spencer Torkelson's moving down. Cole Keith maybe moving up in the lineup. Cole Keith, well. I mean, how about maybe Cole Keith hitting leadoff? Ooh, I don't like that. Okay. Anyway, so, you know, yes, they have some issues with their offense. They're going to have to navigate how to fix it. They don't have a lot of time to do it. They're playing really good teams for the next 14 games. So, you know, and I don't care who you play, as you learned the last two days, if you do not score, you do not win. Period. End of story. Don't care who you're playing. You can play a double A team. Got to score runs, man. All right. So we have one of our favorite guests, a now repeater on Days of Roar. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to have Bobby Scales. We'll be back. All right, I'd like to welcome Bobby Scales, radio analyst for the Detroit Tigers, to the Days of Roar podcast. Bobby is making his second appearance on the podcast, and he's in his second season calling games for the Tigers on the radio. He played 14 seasons between the major leagues, minor leagues, and some ball over in Japan, but not before winning the Big Ten Championship at the University of Michigan in 1999. Go Blue. He worked as the Director of Player Development for the Los Angeles Angels. Also, he is currently the vice president of baseball at Sports Info Solutions. That's right. Bobby Scales has done everything in this beautiful game we all love, and we're lucky enough to have him here the second time on the Days of Roar podcast. Bobby, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. It just means I'm old. That's all all right. So we'll we'll just go with that. (laughs) No, Mark is old. I'm Uh, old, Scales. (laughs) You're not old. All right. So, hey, let's start with the question everyone wants to know. All right. It wasn't surprising to hear you on the radio for the first road trip in Chicago and New York, but you were also on the radio for the first home series in Detroit. I think that's great, but you didn't call any games at Comerica Park last season. What led to you getting some home games and what does your broadcast schedule look like for this season? Oh, no, it was great. It's, it's special for me for a lot of reasons. It was, it was awesome. You know, what led to it, you know, the, the, the powers that be behind the, uh, the assignments 
on that side of it with the, with the Tigers decided that they wanted to get me in market. That's something I wanted to do too. For those of you who don't know, yeah, I went to University of Michigan, but I was also born in Southfield. And, and uh, my mom, born and raised on the west side of Detroit, went to Cooley High School back in the day. My uncle uh, has a church on the west side, has, you know, it's west side of Detroit to this day, Pastor Frank Garrison. So, you know, I've got Detroit roots. I'm, I'm you know, uh, I grew up in Atlanta, but I got a lot of Detroit in me and it's a piece of me and it's real. And so, you know, my grandfather was 37 years on the line at Chevrolet. So, yeah, I, I've got a lot of Detroit in me, blue collar. So it, it was it was a, it was a thing that something that I wanted to do. And I'm going to be I've got 67 games this year. I've got I believe 16 home games. So we'll see. You know, these things, you know, it could be more, could be less. These, these, these things tend to change. But as it stands right now, that's what I've got. Well, Detroit's lucky to have you back, man. No doubt about it. Because you've been here before and, and, you know, you know the place like anybody. But but look, man, so nine games into the season, obviously the Tigers started off really hot, sputtered a little bit against the Oakland Athletics to finish up the home series. But what are your thoughts on the 2024 Tigers after watching nine games? I know that's a super broad question, but, you know, you and I both have been there to see them all. Right. You know, I think it's one of those things where I'm still excited about this baseball team. There's still a lot of good things that we've seen. We've seen some very good pitching performances. You know, today, as we tape this podcast, Jack Flaherty didn't have his best stuff today, but he still battled through six innings, but he was very good against the Chicago White Sox in his first start. So that's, I think the pitching in general as a whole is going to be a plus. Kenta Maeda hasn't had the best two starts of his year. I'm not worried about it. The, the loss is down a little bit. He's been a notorious slow starter anyway uh, in, in some of his Aprils, you know, previously in his career. So again, I'm not necessarily worried about it. I think you're going to get what you expected to get from him as the balance of the season continues to progress on. So pitching wise, I'm very encouraged. The, the strength of this team last year was his bullpen. It's been very good thus far this year as well. A little concerned offensively. I, I say a little concerned, but but we knew there was going to be some offensive challenges. This lineup will be longer with the additions of Gio Urshela and Mark Canna as well. You know, Torque hasn't gotten off to a, a blistering start yet. Just a, a little slow out of the gate. Again, not concerned. I think this team will be better offensively. There's still a ways to go for it to be a premium offense in, in, in today's major league baseball. But again, I think it will be better offensively. So what was six and three right now? Certainly the series against Oakland, a little bit disappointing. Sure. You want to win, you know, Oakland just, they, they're not, they're not very good. They weren't last year. A lot of those same players are back again this year. They're, you know, for whatever reason, they've just got the mojo against the Tigers. Why that is, I don't think anybody really knows why a certain team has really good numbers against another team, especially if that team, you know, hasn't been very good for a while. But they just they just do. It's it's irregardless of the names, irregardless of the final standings of the teams of either team. It just seems like Oakland's got our number, and that's just one of those things. I think that can be one of you see that with some pitchers and some hitters. This guy has really good numbers against this other guy for whatever reason. Who knows? It's just one of those things. So it's not to be just dismissed, but I, I, I'm not concerned. Nine games deep, I think this Tiger team will be better than a year ago, and we got a long. We, we have not even we're not even ten percent away there to see through the season. So it's early. It's it's early, and, and there's, I'm not really concerned at all. So I wanted to ask you a couple things that are kind of ball players' questions, and if you've ever played ball, it'll make a lot of sense. Which is you know, a couple of them. First of all, explain to people how much more difficult it is hitting baseballs in the cold, especially when guys are throwing 95 plus. It's just, it's much more difficult when it's, you know, in that 42 to 55 degree range. It's it's not fun at all, right? No. I mean, you'd rather... Look, this game was made to be played at, at temperatures that are warm. It just was. They're the boys of summer, not the boys of, of coming out of winter. Like, that's not <laughs> that's not how this game was meant to be played. I will say this. It's, first of all, hitting is a difficult period, right? That's why you see guys who fail seven out of ten times be heroes. I think that the game is more power now than it's ever been. You've got more guys throwing harder with nastier stuff than you've ever had. I'll say this though, early on, if you can kind of get your mind over the mental side of it being cold and just 
the general difficulty it is playing baseball in the cold. I think hitters, I don't want to say this. I won't say have an advantage, but pitchers have a tough time gripping the baseball in this weather. Pitchers have a tough time throwing their off speed in this weather because off speed, it's not necessarily a field pitch, but you have to have a really good grip on the baseball. And there's times where just in this cold weather, you just can't get a decent grip on the baseball. It's difficult. And so if you know that, you know, you you might get a few more fastballs than you normally would for the simple fact that these guys, they don't have a great feel for their stuff. I I, you, I was telling actually my play-by-play partner, the legendary Dan Dickerson, it's really difficult early for those guys to spin the breaking ball the way they want to. And there's times where they may want to throw off speed. They may want to throw a slider. They may want to throw a change up. But just because it's cold, they don't have a good grip on it. They're not throwing you their A slider, their A breaking ball. And so they may say, okay, you know what? Normally, if it's June or July, I may throw, I may, I may throw a, a curveball here. I may throw a slider. I may throw a little cutter. But I can't, I can't, I, I just can't get that good grip on the ball. I can't get my fingers on it the way I want to. And they may elect to throw a fastball in certain situations. So I think you see a lot of the, the usage go up in terms of the breaking balls and, and change and change ups as the weather gets warmer because they get more confidence in it. So you may get a few fastballs earlier on. Now, fastball still a well located fastball, still the hardest pitch in the game to hit, right? So it it's the the difficulty is always high because it's hitting the baseball's hard. But I, I do think that sometimes early in the year you can get a few more ages than you normally would in, in different in, later in the year. Now I will I will add without getting too scientific about it that the weather diminishes ball flight. So a ball that might go 380 and end up five feet from the fence now is going to be a home run in a month when it's 15 degrees warmer and the ball's carrying more. It's, you know, there's... No, that's fair. Anybody that wants to look up Alan Nathan and, you know, he's one of the best baseball scientists in the world, he's done many discussions about how much farther the ball flies based on weather and based on wind. And, you know, the Tigers had a day the other day, they hit a few balls that were well struck, just ended up not carrying far enough, stayed in the park. And I, I think, you know, in a, in, in a month, those balls, all three, three of those balls would have gone out. So Meadows, I think hit one, they, they had a couple of balls that they were yeah pretty well hit. You know, the, the other question I had is people love to put a lot of emphasis on how guys hit in spring training, but explain to the public the difference between facing spring training, pitching, sequencing, just the entire aspect of hitting in Florida versus walking to a major league game where it's, it's, I equate it to if you've ever played on beginner's mode in a video game and then played and then played on the expert mode. It's right. about the difference between those two levels because when you add in sequencing and all kinds of pitching to certain weaknesses and it, it's just a whole different level of degree of difficulty. Can you expand on that a little bit so people understand how much different it is? Yeah, Mark, I, look, absolutely. It's, it's a situation where in spring training, especially early on in spring training, guys are literally just trying to get their – it's more about me than it is about me trying to get you out if I'm, if I'm a pitcher, Right. You're working on things. You're going to do things early on, especially in spring training, that you never do in in the regular season competition. For instance, right? Let's just say you're in your first spring training outing. You may not throw a breaking ball at all. You just really want to get a, 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 a feel for your fastball command. You want to make sure you're getting – you you may have a goal to get – I want to get 15 pitches glove – 15 fastballs of glove side. And really make sure I nail those fi- first 15 pitches glove side. You may th- three throw – four, five, six heaters in a row just because you're really trying to work on something. Now, whether they get whacked or not, you really don't care. You just want to make sure you get your fastball going where you want to go. Or you may have an outing where, okay, I was messing with a new grip in my changeup in my bullpen session, and I really want to take this this changeup into the game. I may throw 10 first, I may first face 12 hitters that day in the spring training game, and I'm going to throw 10 first pitch changeups. 
you wouldn't throw 10 first pitch changeups in the game. Even if that changeups your pitch, normally. You may throw, like I said before, you may throw five, six fastballs in a row. You may throw 10, 11 sliders in a row because you're working on a new slider grip. So it's all these things. Most, most of your early of your spring training outings, especially early on, you're completely consumed with what you're trying to do. You don't care who the hitter is in the box. It's, it's unimportant. Now, the last couple of starts, you're getting closer to what you may do as far as game planning wise and in terms of sequencing wise to what you would actually do to that lineup. Not to mention until the last maybe two, sometimes even the last spring training out you get as a starting pitcher, you're not getting anybody's real lineup. You've got a bunch of guys who are hopeful. You've got a bunch of non-roster invites. You may have a couple, you may have a guy, you may have a guy that's scratched out of the lineup. And then all of a sudden some kid that's number 99 who doesn't have a name on the back of his jersey who's from the minor league camp is actually starting a game and you have no knowledge in him. You don't care because you're just trying to execute the things you're trying to execute. There's so many different things that 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 you will see in a spring training game that you will never see in a in a regular season game. And and because of that, your your game planning, how you go about it, the way you throw the certain pitches. And even even if you let's say even if it's the last let's say it's your last outing of the year. Let's say you know the 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 Tigers are playing Toronto. It might be your last spring training outing of a of a of a given spring training schedule. You're gonna see we're gonna see Toronto 13 times during the season. There's things you just don't want to show. You know maybe I've I've got a new pitch. I've, I've revamped the way my my slider shape. They're not gonna see that. I'm not gonna throw that to them. I may throw it on a backfield against whoever. I may go to the minor league side and, and face whoever. I don't want them to get any read on that. I don't want them to get any pitch metrics on that. So it, there's a lot of reasons why the spring training outing slash statistics slash appearances can not look anything like what you want to see in a regular season. But Bobby, can you help me understand what that means for hitters then too? Because I think about a perfect example being Parker Meadows, right? What he did in spring training was phenomenal. Hit over 350, four home runs, but you know, you only put so much weight into these spring training stats, but at the same time, it's very clear that Parker Meadows somewhere in there can hit. We saw him do it at the AAA level as well. Like he can hit, he does have pop in the bat, but to start the season, only two hits. And even going back to last year, you know, he got that, that taste in the big leagues, you know, got, I think 125 at bats and he hit, you know, 232 with three homers and it wasn't very consistent. So, right. I guess kind of what what does it mean for a guy like him or, or for his situation? How much can we read into what what did you do in spring training versus what you're doing now? Well, you want to see with a guy like him, a young hitter like him, who is establishing himself in the big leagues. He has nothing left to prove in the minor leagues. He's, we, we've got the receipts from that. The biggest thing with a kid like Parker Meadows is, is you want to see consistency of approach and you want to see consistency of process. And that's the biggest thing you're trying to establish in, in spring training. What is his process? Okay, we know he's going to be on this team. And we know he's going to be on this team because he has nothing left to prove in the minor leagues. He had a perfectly fine debut. It was up and down. Rookies are up and down. That's the nature of being a rookie. That's the nature of being of doing something for the first time in your life. You're not going to, typically speaking, you're not going to be very good at it. And you're going to get better. Now, Parker Battles had a fine debut last year. It was a little bit up and down. There were some things certainly he needed to work on. And you feel like in the all season and through spring training, he did that. So there's going to be some inconsistency naturally, but it's consistency. What do, is, is he consistency consistently on time? What is the quality of his content? What are the quality of his swing decisions? Are is he swinging at the correct pitches that he can hit and he can and hit hard on a on a effective basis? Where are the holes in his swing? Mike Trout came to the big had a big hole at the top of the top of his zone. It took him two, three, two and a half, three years to close that zone to where he understood. Those are some pitches I probably shouldn't swing at. And, and clearly he made that adjustment and he became the Mike Trout, who was one of the best players on the planet. So it, it's it's understanding who you are as a hitter, understanding who you aren't as a hitter, and making sure that you can be effective when those balls come in the zones that, that you're supposed to fire on, that you do that and you minimize the chase, you minimize uh, the poor uh, approaches at bat. So it's, it's, it's not the what. For a player like him in spring training, it's not the what, it's not the results, it's the how. So we make sure that the how in his approach, how he's going about it, how he's preparing is the right way. And regardless of the results, 
certainly, you know, if, if, if his spring training was, you know, his, his process in spring training was in, was in question, was in doubt, then it'd be, uh, you know, cause for alarm. It wasn't. And from what I saw, it wasn't. And from, you know, the way that AJ and, and the rest of the tiger hitting brain trust felt like it wasn't Parker Meadows is going to be okay. It's just a matter of him getting, getting up to speed this season and continuing off and picking up where he left off last year. It's just a matter of if he can endure the failure temporarily, doesn't allow him to wear, doesn't allow it to wear him down here early and make some change his approach. Hopefully, if he can put a good swing or two uh, on the baseball in a game, that'll probably get him back on track. It, it leads me into, you know, another person that perfectly exhibits what you're discussing, which is when you watch Colt Keith at bats, oh my goodness, is there a plan there? Oh, does he understand what he's doing? Does he have command of the strike zone? Does he understand when to give up a little bit, take the ball the other way? It, it, it's really impressive and a really advanced approach, not to mention the swing is short and he seems to be able to duplicate it almost every at bat. I'm sure they'll find a hole or two that we haven't figured out yet. But, you know, talk a little bit about what you're seeing from him. We haven't had tremendous results yet, but not not bad. No, it's 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 more than not bad. It's it's actually pretty good. I mean, I know I'm not no the numbers don't matter. Numbers don't matter right now. The traditional time that you want to have a look at, okay, where are we? About 120 at bats in. If you're a, if if you're an everyday position player in the big leagues, you're talking about Memorial Day ish. That's usually the marker for when you want to first have your first look at what's going on from a number standpoint. Again, process is your process sound. If your process is sound, the results will be what they're supposed to be. I truly believe that. And you hear AJ talk about that all the time. You hear good hitters talk about and good pitchers talk about all the time. What is my process? If you're working with a sound process, they'll be what they want to be. And, and I'll say this before we move on to Col- I know your your question was about Colt Keith, and, and I'll I'll land this plane in a second. But Parker Meadows and Colt Keith right now, for me, their process is okay, and 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 they're both having very mature at bats. Parker Meadows Meadows has, has a number of walks. And then the thing that I like about Cole Keith, to answer your question more directly about him, there was he had in the doubleheader, he had four absolute rockets. Three of them were the other, other way, and he got three hits off of them. And he hit that ball off the wall in left center field, in city field, when nobody was hitting any balls, even pull side, that were getting to the track. And he absolutely smashed that ball against the wall, split a gap, and then got another hit and got two other hits the other way. For me, as a young hitter, I'm watching a guy who has – the ability to hit the ball hard the other way and do so consistency, that's a great sign. A lot of times, young hitters really struggle with that ball away or really struggle with going the other way with pitches and taking what the pitchers give them. So he's showing me right now a very, to your point, a very mature, very advanced approach. And 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 the results for both, I think, I really believe for both those guys are on the way. But Cole Keith, you can see what, you know, Scott Harris and Jeff Greenberg saw in, in, in giving him the you know, the extension they gave him right out of the gate before he took an at-bat in the big leagues. But it, it is an advanced approach. It is a mature approach. And I think I think both of those guys are showing that right now. Obviously, the results with Parker are a little bit, you know, leave a little bit to do desired. But I think the approach is sound, and I think there's going to be some better results to come. When guys are drawing walks, that's a good thing. We've seen that from Parker Meadows and from Cole Keith both. I mean, when they're – you look at their walk-strikeout ratio and you see how those stack up against how many plate appearances they've had. Like, those are a good sign. When those guys are drawing walks, it tells me that, you know, they're on the right track. But Bobby, I want to ask you about Spencer Torkelson. That's a big name. Obviously, a guy who went out and hit 31 home runs last year. Someone who hit 233. The hope is maybe he could be a 250 type hitter who could run into to 35, 40 a year. And that maybe is the upside for Spencer Torkelson. But what have you seen so far in this season? Would you see the, the taste that you got in spring training? And what is it going to take for him to build upon the season that he had last year or at least repeat it? Well, the the biggest hope I have for Torque, just thinking about this in the off season and, and going into this season, is the fact that I, I was just hoping that he wouldn't feel the pressure to do more. The guy went thirty one and ninety four last year. That's a big year, and I know I am not of the I am not of the mind that batting average doesn't matter at all, right? You know, it's just like it's just like Pete Alonso hit two seventeen last year. He also hit forty six bombs. Like 
he had a good year. It's and, and does your batting average matter? Sure, it matters to a certain degree. I think that what matters more is it's the level of production. You know, it was thirty one and ninety four. You know, you, you think you think of guys who have big years. You, you're you're thinking about thirty and a hundred. He was right there. He did thirty one, and he was six shy of a hundred. So if he continues to do that, am I can if I do I care that he hit two thirty three? Not really. Would I love for him to hit 260? I think he's capable of that. I think he's capable of 260, 35, and 110. I, I do. So he's not far off of that. And so I'm not concerned about the average. I'm concerned about the production, the production, when the production was there. And what I don't want Spencer Torkelson to do is to feel the pressure to do more. Go out there and do what you did. Are there things that you need to improve on? Absolutely. Every hitter has things they need to improve on. We just, I just gave you the trout reference and I give you the trout reference because I saw it happen his, you know, years two through five in the big leagues when I was watching him every day when I was working for the Angels. And so there's going to be natural growth there. I think Torque is a very routine oriented guy. I think he has a good idea of the things that he's good at. I, he also has a good idea of the things where he needs to improve. And I think you will see that happen you know, throughout the season. And again, it is early and it is, and the weather is a thing. So, you know, as this as as this as this season gets a little bit deeper and the weather gets a little better, I think you'll see all of these guys improve. All right, I want to ask you a little something about Torque. You know, understanding hitting the way you do, I understand hitting a little bit. But uh, what worries me about Torque was is that 2022 just never on time, never on time, and and didn't really have a plan. It was more. Of he was he was more playing defense than offense when he walked into the batter's box. Okay, and in a lot of ways, even during spring training, it just seems like he's searching to be on time, and it's starting to affect what the plan is when he's getting in the box. Instead of going, I'm not swinging at anything before strike two in these zones. I'm looking for this. This is what I know I can handle every time. It's kind of degraded a little bit, and it just doesn't seem, it just seems kind of messy up there a little bit besides being on time from an approach standpoint. So right. it, it that concerns me a little bit because it was only a year ago. It was only in 2022 that we experienced the same thing with him. So, I mean, how how do hitters somehow find that timing mechanism back and, and at least get into the groove? Do they have to simplify things or is it is it just something about how your brain finally adjusts to seeing pitching every day? Well, I think it's, it's all of those things. And I, and I do think you're right. I, I kind of, I said it on air the other day, you know, Dan was kind of asking me the same question. It, it, for me, it felt like he was tweened. And when I say tweened, he was ahead of the breaking balls and behind the fastball, right? So you're in that no man's land where you're not on anything. And for me, timing at the plate, you have some guys that will, that will feel differently about this. At the end of the day, for me, if you are not on his best fastball, then you're, you're late. And there's a saying, it's one of those things, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And there's no middle ground. So I know one of the things that, 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 that in searching for that and having been in a, spe- in a space as a hitter, when you're searching for that, you have to be crazy early. You might have to sacrifice two, three, four, five at-bats when you're ridiculously early to find your way back on time, which is slightly early, right? And it's kind of a messy how I'm describing it, but that's the best way I know how to describe it is. If you are early, you are on time. If you are, if you think you're on, if you think you're on time, you're actually late. And so, just simplifying your moves, starting a little earlier, feeling like you're just, you're just early. God, it, it's it's really messy how to describe it, right? But yeah. when you feel it, and you know it. But this feeling like you're just there so early, you're almost waiting on the ball to be thrown. The reality of the situation is, you're going to get to a point where you get right and. When you're on time for that, when, you, when you're on time for his best fastball and you arrive in balance, you will swing at the breaking balls you're supposed to, the hangers, the ones you can do something with. And more importantly, you'll take the ones you can't. And when you do that, that's when you're really right. And, and at that point, you know, these guys are all big league hitters. Spencer Torkelson is a successful big league hitter. He's at 30 home runs in a season and driven in 94 to big leagues. Once he gets there, the rest will take care of itself. 
And he has shown an ability to make that adjustment in the past too, right? I mean, we saw him go from his 2022 season to his 2023. And even after a slow start in 2023, being able to turn on the Jets. And he had a great second half last year. So I think that has to you know be kept in mind as well. This is a guy who has shown that he can make the adjustments. He can go from not being on time to getting on time. And he can get there. I think that's a really positive sign. No, and something that we got we to keep in mind. No, I think you're right. And, and the, for me, the biggest thing that, that, you know, doing the whole, getting this job at the time I got it last year and preparing, you know, going through and you know, watching some of the video I saw and you look at the 2022 season, the question you have is, can he hit the fastball? Well, he was really good against 95 plus last year. Okay. And so to me, once you cross that hurdle, it, it, he's still young. It's not like he's old, you know, he's in his mid thirties and that becomes a question. Can he still get to a heater? We know that he can so now just getting on time for that good heater and being able to adjust the off speed is, is, is what he just has to find. He has to find that good timing for the 2020, for, for the 2024 season. Get there and stay there as long as possible. It's going to come and go because that's hitting, right? But what you don't want to have is the violent swings in that time. You want the, you want that, the, that, the, that wave pattern, so to speak, to even out. And when you do that and when you have the, the, the distance between the peaks and valleys shorten, that's when you build that consistency. All right. So, you know, I want to quick get a quick, you know, two minutes from you about Riley Green because the swings the first four or five days were, you know, anybody that's watched Riley for a long time, and I know you have too, you know, if there's ever a problem, it's he's kind of spinning, hitting a lot of ground balls at second base. But when he gets on time and on plane, he typically is pretty good about staying there. I especially love when I see him hit the bottle left center field between you and mm-hmm. I. But it seems like the last four or five days, he gets closer and closer every day to getting more locked in. You know, you've seen a couple of bombs the last few days, had a few other good swings. Tell me what you're seeing, and do you think he's pretty close? I think he's pretty close, and there's a couple of indicators for me with him. I remember last year early in the season, now again, I wasn't around the team in 22. I wasn't really around the team in spring training of 23. And, and when I started doing these games last year, I saw he was hitting a lot of ground balls, a lot of balls on the ground. And typically speaking, when you're hitting a lot of balls on the ground, there's a couple of different ways you're getting about it. Number one, you're catching the ball too far, too deep, okay? There's, you know, you see the shirts, you know, there's there's a lot of, in on hitting Twitter, there's a saying called the party's out front from an offensive perspective. The party being out front means, we talked about this a little bit, I think last time I was on, is is you want to, most balls that are hit hard and hit far, meaning the doubles and homers, the extra base hits, are hit anywhere between six and nine inches out in front of the plate. Okay, that, that's contact point. It's not, it's not playing of your swing. It's where you're catching the ball. If you're catching the ball out front of you relative to the plate, Okay, that's when those are the balls that get driven. The further back you move, is that those are the balls that are get hit up, get hit on the ground. Sometimes Riley just catches the ball too deep, and so when he moves his contact point out front, that's when he starts stinging those balls in the gap, both opposite field and pull side. And so, and so it's just a matter of I think moving that contact point out front, shifting your focus a little bit out front, not way out front. We're talking as we're talking a few inches. That's all it is, right? And and we've seen more of that lately where his contact point is more consistently out in front of him and he's stinging those balls to the left center field and he's stinging those balls to the pull side instead in doing so with authority. And and the exit velocity is the same, but you're catching it a little bit further out front and thus you're catching the ball, you're you're elevating those balls and getting those, those balls in the air more. So and then the other thing with him is, you know, he his swing plane is uphill when it's too far uphill is where even though you're catching those balls out front, you might be catching the top of those baseballs as opposed to as opposed to having his swing plane be a t- just a touch flatter. Now, we're not talking flat. We're not talking down. But we're talking a touch flatter. He's catching those balls out front, and that's when you're getting that stuff elevated, both opposite field and pull side. He looks pretty close. No, absolutely. I, there's nothing to change at this point. There's no change. There's no worry. You know, and, and with him, hell, it's just about making sure he's on the field. You know, and not and not suffer a freak injury. So, and he's been great. You've seen him die for balls. You've seen him, you know, throw his body around. That's how he plays. You're not going to change that, nor should you change that. He's going to, you know, we just hope that he stays away from the freak injury, of course. And the Tigers aren't asking him to change that either, which I think is really, really, really special. That's important. They're putting him in the corners where he needs to be. They're going to let him go play 
Yep. They're going to let him be Riley Green, and Riley Green's a really special player. You can't. You have the guy has to be who he is, or else he's not him. And it sounds it sounds stupid to say, but it's the truth. He's got to let him be who he is, or he's not him. So yeah, by all means. I mean, he, I, I, you know, it's funny because we're talking about this Tiger offense. I think we got a bunch of guys that are really close. Here's the thing: can they can they arrive in a good spot together? That's the thing, and then sustain that. It, it, and and I feel like you know what we're gonna we're, we're getting ready to see because the, the the schedule isn't getting any easier. It's, it's getting ready to get real. Okay, you know I know that Texas. I don't, I'm gonna mess up the sequence, but there's uh, Minnesota. There's you know obviously we're getting ready. We're playing we're playing the Pittsburgh Pirates here coming up the next couple of days, and and I'm not sure exactly what the next home stand looks like I'm, off the top of my head. But the, you know, there's Minnesota mixed in there. There's Texas mixed in there. I think Houston somewhere mixed in in this next stretch. It's it's getting ready to get real. You're getting ready to ch- really see what's going on here. It's definitely going to be interesting to see, Bobby. That's all we have for you right now. But man, we really appreciate your time. I mean, you you are a two time guest. We would love to make you a three time guest in the near future, as long as you're okay with it, because we love having you, man. It's such a treat. Oh, I appreciate it. Hey, Ev. I think B Scales is now the first crew member of Days of Roar. I mean, we, we don't, we 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 don't add. We've never added anyone to the crew, but I think B Scales is the is is now a de facto crew member of Days of Roar. So I'm sure we'll we'll have him back on again a few times during the hey, season. You, you guys know whatever you need from me, you got it. Just let me know. Yeah, we'll be hitting up your line quite a bit, man. Th- thank you for joining us, man, so much. We appreciate it. You bet. Everyone, that was Bobby Scales, radio analyst for the Detroit Tigers. Mark and I have a few more things to discuss as we preview the upcoming week and get ready to wrap up. But before we do that, let's take a quick break. Bobby Scales, as always, personal favorite of Evan and I. We'll have him back a bunch more times. It's just so fun to talk to him and can lend a perspective on so many different aspects of it. Pardon me. So many different aspects of baseball, both as a player, an exec, a scout, and now a broadcaster. So, all right, we got upcoming series against the Pirates. The Pirates have been playing extremely well. We got Reese Olsen and Casey Mize, which sounds pretty sexy these days, Reese Olsen and uh, Casey Mize, coming up here Monday and Tuesday. And we got four games against the Twins, and we're going to get right into it. Twins had a few injuries, but you got to play play whoever you play, man. That's why I don't really worry too much about who we're playing. If you're good, you're going to really not matter who you're playing. You just got to play well. Well, it's so, funny, Mark, you mentioned that because last week I was talking, and I was telling uh, I was telling you on the podcast, right? Hey, look, the Tigers have a real opportunity with what they have coming up. You got the Mets, who obviously are, are pretty dysfunctional at this point, kind of all over the place. A lot of question marks you know, up and down in that organization right now and, and with where they're headed moving forward. And then you got Oakland and anybody can beat Oakland. And then, you know, you got two games against Pittsburgh and I, and I might have disrespected the Pittsburgh Pirates a little bit on last week's episode. And I was joking with the guys when I was in 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 New York, the, the fellow beat writers, I, I told them, I said, hey, look, like I thought the Pirates were going to be like a cakewalk or something like that. And then I look up and, you know, they've got, they've got one of the best records, if not the best record in the National League. So sorry to the Pittsburgh Pirates for disrespecting you. They can play ball. They showed that they could play ball early last season, too. They got off to a really, really good start. They seem to be doing the same this year. They've got some guys in that lineup. Love O'Neill Cruz. I think he's a lot of fun. But yeah, it should be an interesting pitching matchup with Reese Olsen against Mitch Keller, Casey Mize against Martin Perez. That'll be an interesting matchup. The Tigers going up against Perez and a lefty. I think that's just fascinating to see how they maneuver lefties throughout the year. Perez can be really difficult. Maybe that's a game where Parker Meadows doesn't get a start. Maybe that's a game where Cole Keith doesn't get a start. We'll see how they maneuver with some of their, you know, lefty bats against a lefty and Martin Perez. But interesting pitching matchups. Casey Mize, I thought he was solid. I mean, he came back, and that's something that we didn't even really get to touch on was, you know, he came back and he made his first first big league start in 700-some days, and he held up. He held up. I thought he pitched well. I thought he went out there and he, you know, he showed that he belonged at this level. And that was really impressive to see. He showed he's got battle. He showed he's got fight in him. There were certain things about his outing that he didn't really like a whole lot. But again, he's his own biggest perfectionist, right? He's going to nitpick and, and, and be that kind of guy. But to see him go, you know, four and a third, 
He gave up three runs, five hits, two walks, four strikeouts. But to see Casey Mize throw 87 pitches and pitch into the fifth inning, I thought that was a great sign, a great first step. Um, it's really going to be about continuing to build off of that. I think he has a good opportunity to do so against the Pirates. And then, Mark, the big thing is going to be Twins are going to be coming to town. And I think we're going to learn a lot about the Tigers in that series. The Twins have a 3-4 and a four record right now. It's so early for all of these teams. But I'm very interested to see how the Tigers play against the Minnesota Twins. We talked about it. We had Bobby Nightingale, the Minnesota Twins B writer, on the podcast to talk about it just because the way that you look at Central, it's Tigers-Twins right at the top. It seems like those are going to be the two teams that are battling it out when it comes to the end. Maybe Cleveland sneaks their way in there, maybe Kansas City. But you gotta have, you got to have respect for what, what Minnesota does over there, record aside at this point. So I think we're going to learn a lot in that series. You're going to have Maeda and Flaherty in that series. You need a good game from both of them. So excited to see what Casey Mize can do. Very encouraged by the split that he threw. Probably the best split he's ever thrown as a Tiger. And see if he can build upon that. All right, it's time to get out of here. You got to go to Pittsburgh in the morning. It's been a really, really busy week of baseball. So I want to remind everybody to rate, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, etc. And you can always find us embedded in every Evan Petzold article at Freep.com. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell anybody who likes Tiger Baseball. Hopefully a lot more fun this year. Hopefully it will be fun to listen to. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Kirk Crawford and Anjanette Delgado, as always. Free press editor, Nicole Avery Nichols. And of course, the man that makes us sound good every week. Robin Chan, our boy. Couldn't do it without you, Robin. Love to my grandson, Raven Michael Gorash, and the spectacular Savannah Petzold, who actually got to see her husband in more than five minutes this week. I hope uh, she enjoyed being able to see you. And uh, Evan Petzold's cats were also happy that he came home. So from a partner, my super busy partner, my super tired partner, we'll see you next week. And to everybody, peace. Peace.